So just a basic question of why we would want to make a house more energy efficient. Um, for one, of course, it's lower costs. So we were testing these houses and we were looking to see if, in some cases we could get up to a 30 or even 40% reduction in annual energy costs. Uh, so again, that was the most effective way to get through to people is to show this cost savings that you could have. And so we uh, typically were aiming for about a 15% improvement and we could get higher than that in some cases. Uh, then also to improve air quality. Uh, so you think of having cleaner air if you're controlling how much air is coming in and out of your house. Uh, you're not getting clouds of pollen in your house like we've had this past week. Uh, you wouldn't, you'd be cutting down on the humidity, which of course is an issue for us in this area. Um, even cutting down on pests and infiltration into your building. So overall, it is um, cutting down on outdoor air pollution. It's really you know, something that's going to be effective in a variety of ways besides just saving money. It is pro producing a cleaner environment for your home. And of course, it does protect the environment, uh, reducing our dependency on fossil fuels. And when we were doing that uh, project in Charleston, it was still SCE and G was still our major energy company. And they partnered with us on some of these aspects because for even the big energy companies, they don't necessarily want us to be spending or using so much electricity. Uh, that means the more electricity that we're using, the more power plants they have to build and maintain. And as we saw with the um, nuclear plant up in a VC nuclear plant just a, a couple years ago. Uh, that can be a really taxing and difficult process to build a power plant to maintain it. And so they were actively trying to keep energy usage down because from their perspective, it helps their business model too. So we did have some buy-in from the uh, energy companies as well. So historic buildings are a little bit different. And so, uh, you know, you can, a lot of the things we'll talk about today apply to a historic building or a non-historic building. Uh, technically by the, uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, a uh, historic building is, can be anything that's 50 years or older. Uh, that's when it starts to be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, certainly we have a big stock of buildings that are built before uh, or that are older than, 19, than 50 years old. Uh, so you can have uh, different materials in these historic buildings, everything from plaster walls versus a drywall, uh, lime-based mortars instead of a uh, cement-based or concrete-based mortar that will be in between bricks or stones in a contemporary building. And a lot of them are also wood framed and wood clad. So that means it's a wood shingle building on the outside, which um, is fairly common here in Columbia, but certainly it, you, you'd see that over at our Woodrow Wilson house and Man Simon site as well and Majeska Simpkins. But uh, that was very common in Charleston with the Charleston single houses. And so, you know, when you have that wood framing, that's going to be a very different type of maintenance than what you have in modern types of buildings that are going to be, um, you know, a, even hardy plank as the exterior. You could have more of a, a modern made or a machine made brick that would be the exterior there or vinyl siding. Um, all are going to behave very differently when we're talking about energy efficiency. Uh, so, and the way those are treated has to be viewed differently. And you know, you, you can't just take out a section of plaster wall very easily and put in insulation behind it. But for a drywall, you could certainly easily take out a panel of drywall, blow in insulation behind it, and just pop another section of drywall up on top. Um, you can't really do that with those historic buildings and with that plaster. So we had to really address all the different materials you would see there. Uh, their construction. So these buildings were designed to ventilate. Um, historic buildings are meant to be a little bit drafty. They're meant to be able to um, ebb and flow, to expand and contract with temperature and humidity changes. And so we can't uh, seal them up quite as tight as you can in other buildings. But there are ways that you can make a big difference. And we'll talk about that as we go through. Having a non-solid subfloor was a pretty big difference too. Our modern buildings today, usually your subfloor is uh, one or two layers of um, particle board or rather just sort of a hardwood board that's there. And then that would uh, make a pretty solid seal. And then you don't have uh, an infiltration coming through the floorboards. So you have to consider that too. 
And then also regulations, state and local regulations. So for historic preservation, your local district is what's going to have the most teeth. Uh, that's going to be what can enforce policies and be the most uh, particular about what you can and can't do with the exterior of your building. Uh, here in Columbia and in Charleston, those regulations are in historic districts and also are uh, going to be thinking of or looking at what you can see from the public right of way. So from the public right of way, you can't uh, put on solar panels without approval from the um, Board of Architectural Review or other bodies of the state or city. Um, and if you have any kind of historic designations with your house, there are other criteria that come into play too. Uh, so you have to look at that and know your district and know any kind of uh, rules and regulations that may apply to a historic building. Now we said a little bit of how historic buildings are built differently. They are meant to have airflow. And so this is just a great um, rustic, but very good diagram of how historic buildings are designed to work. So you see, if you start from the bottom that you have rising damp coming through the foundation. So the foundation of a historic building is going to be a, you know, stone or um, brick or a paver of some kind, sometimes even still pressed dirt with a, a layer over top, but something natural and something that is going to allow for moisture to rise up. Now, traditionally, if you had a fireplace, a fireplace heating the house, uh, that fire would dry out that damp air as it rises up, but also the damp air would seep into brick, stone, or wood that the house is made from, and it would easily dry out. Um, one of our colleagues had a great comparison of a cloth shower curtain versus a vinyl or plastic shower curtain. Uh, with the cloth curtain, you are going to, it's going to absorb the moisture, it's going to get pretty soaking wet, but it dries out pretty quickly because it's so thin and the moisture is spread out so evenly that it's pretty easy for it to evaporate. Uh, versus a vinyl shower curtain or plastic where it's just going to act like a barrier and keep moisture or water out. So that's one of the best ways to look at a historic building versus a modern one is that uh, historic buildings were meant to get some moisture, to let it dry out and to sort of ebb and flow through this process. Modern buildings are designed to have a barrier, to have a shield and to be uh, pretty strict in not letting any infiltration of moisture in. So it's a big difference in how those two buildings um, need to be ventilated and can be ventilated when we talk about some of these changes that we'll see and suggestions for improving efficiency. Um, this, so the wind is drying that out, the um, you know, moisture is drying out for the evaporation. Um, lime wash that would be common in the interior of buildings could also hold in some moisture until it evaporates. Plaster certainly can too. So you know your average historic building can really take on a lot of moisture and let it dry out over time and not be negatively affected by that. Whereas with a building today, if you get moisture behind drywall, you know, you're probably going to have to take out a big chunk of the drywall. If you get mold built up in there, there's nowhere for the moisture to go. Um, and that's not the way that historic buildings are, are meant to operate. So these historic buildings are also meant to be a little bit different because they're built for their environments. Uh, today, you could see the exact same contemporary house put up in Columbia, as you could see up in Michigan, and they're not always really adapting for the environment. But one of the reasons that historic buildings are so unique in every city, in every place you go, is because they are made for their environments. Um, of course, this is Siebel's house that we have here in this photograph. That's our headquarters. And you see this big porch that we have across the front of the building. Uh, that was something that was added onto the house later, but you could see that that makes sense because you want to keep the building cool, as cool as possible. And that's our main focus in the South is cooling off our buildings. And so having this great big porch is going to shade uh, all those windows on the front of the house. Um, even having the dormer windows on the top floor, if you opened those up and opened up just the bottom floor windows, you get a nice airflow coming in through the bottom windows and actually pulling up and going out of the top windows. So it creates the stack effect of air moving through. Uh, so a lot of these designs were meant for their environments and made to be comfortable. 
the Robert Mills house. You know, we always look at the front of the house or most of the time we do, but on the back of the house, this uh, three level porch essentially makes for a really great environment that uh, stays cool. The bottom floor on the basement level would be a great space that you could uh, sit outside. There could be work being done, even some cooking. Um, we often talk about churning butter with kids out here on field trips. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that could be done in that shaded cool space. The basement is raised up in this house so that you do have a working space that would be cool and dark and would be somewhat insulated and keep the building at a reasonable temperature all year round. Uh, we have had the air conditioning go out in that building before and really the basement and main floor doesn't get above about 78 to 80 degrees. I think it may have gotten to 81, um, but that's because you know it's well insulated on that basement level and it is built that way and, and built to, um, to manage this environment. But we're not really thinking about that in a lot of our modern buildings anymore. So this is also the Sanborn Fire Insurance map for the arcade building. Uh, the arcade building is this um, orange building, this L-shaped right here. And if you see down the middle of it, there's this uh, dotted line and it says razor five feet. And that's because in the middle of the arcade building was originally meant to be, and it's still there, uh, a raised section and along the center, and there were windows. It was actually open originally, but then even when they put a roof on, there were some windows there for ventilation. So again, if you open the doors on either side, and then you have the roof open at the top, it's going to suck in that uh, air and move it through the building and out through the top. So there are a lot of ways that these buildings are meant to act this way and meant to have their own cooling systems. And sometimes that gets overlooked when we're just thinking about whether to turn on the air conditioning or turn on the heat. And that's not exactly how they're all meant to be. Of course, windows are very effective too. Um, historically, windows were very operational and would have been used almost every day. Uh, so some historic houses have interior shutters, some have exterior or both, and these would be meant to be open and closed. And it wasn't just for privacy, but it would also be for um, climate control. So for the, a hot summer day, you would probably keep the windows on the southern side, um, in the eastern side too, closed in the morning and closed until the heat of the day is over, and then you may open them up in, at night. And uh, the Historic Charleston Foundation did an interesting experiment. If anyone's familiar with their building, it's the Miss Roon House. It's on the Battery in Charleston. It's really one of the very last buildings you would see before the Battery technically begins. So it's kind of sticking out there into the edge of the harbor and doesn't have any shade or trees around it. So they did an experiment where they closed all the shutters on the south side of their building um, during July and August. And they found that they, just from doing that, saved about 12% in their energy costs from July and August. And of course, those are our hottest months and the most difficult time to cool the building. And so that was a good example and really inspired other residents in Charleston to begin to use their shutters more and make sure that you are uh, closing those during the, the hot times of the month or times of the day. And then opening them up when it's cooler. Uh, same in the winter, they could be very good for insulation. So you can close those up on the shadier sides of the house and uh, just keep the insulation inside the warmth inside the house from a fireplace and not have it escaping through the window there. So these historic buildings do have a lot of great resources that are, get overlooked a lot of times and they really are designed to be um, adjustable for the climate. Now, regardless if this is a historic building or a modern building, you are going to be looking at the building envelope. Uh, so the building envelope is the exterior perimeter of the building. And this is any kind, any kind of penetration into the building envelope is going to cut down on the efficiency of your building. So again, we've been talking about historic buildings and how uh, you know, they have a lot of penetrations. They have a lot of holes with um, cracks and, and parts of the house that aren't necessarily solidly sealed. And our modern houses are built with a tighter seal around them. Uh, so our trick is just kind of figuring out where it's good to seal for something and where it might need to be left open a little bit for those historic buildings. But overall, you wanna make sure that the building envelope is pretty tightly sealed. Um, so this is also showing how air moves through the building. 
So it starts down here at the bottom, cold air is seeping in through the basement, the subfloor, the first floor of the house, and then through the stack effect, it gets moved to the top and out through the attic and the, um, the top of the house, the roof of the house. I can move out through fireplaces and through any kind of, especially if there's an open staircase, air is going to be moving through there. And so it is sort of this vacuum effect of pulling air from the bottom out through the top as it warms up. So we want to make sure when we're looking at sealing a building, the most important places to seal are going to be the tops and the bottoms. So this bottom right here, whatever separating your living space from the unclimate controlled space beneath it, and then the top here in the attic. So doing those, sealing those parts of the house are really going to be your biggest return on investment. Uh, the other little penetrations around doors and windows, even plumbing penetrations, they do add up and it does matter. And we do want to make sure that we address those as well. But you're going to see the biggest investment or the biggest return for your investment um, insulating the top and the bottom of the house. So trying to figure out what a house might need. Um, this is a blower door test. So that's what you see in the picture here. Um, I'm wondering if anyone's ever heard of a blower door test or seen one done, I would love to hear about that too. Uh, but this is what we were doing when I refer to us testing our houses for energy efficiency. Um, any, any house that we went into through the project I worked on, they all got an energy efficiency test, a blower door test. And what this does is you put it in the main front door of your house, the fan that you see on the bottom right here, um, that is pulling air out of the house. So it is um, pressurizing the house. And so when it is sucking the air out, you can get a reading for when it kind of stabilizes or tops off. And that can tell you, depending on what that reading is, how much air is leaking into the building. Uh, so it's basically sucking all the air out and through that front door. And depending on how hard the fan has to blow, you can tell how leaky the building is or not. So it doesn't specifically point out where the holes are, but when the fan is running, you can walk through the house and you can feel where the air is coming in. Uh, so while the fan is running, again, pulling this air out of the house, you can walk around by the sink and uh, see that where the, the pipes are coming in, you can feel that there might be airflow there. Um, even electrical outlets will sometimes have a little bit of an air leakage if they're on an exterior wall. Um, anything around windows, those kinds of places. And so you can really feel how efficient a building is or isn't. Um, and generally for a, a house that's under 3,000 square feet, you can use just one of these blower doors, uh, depending on the configuration or how many stories, you might need more. Uh, we did one of these tests on the, um, the Nathaniel Russell house in Charleston, which was fascinating because that is a huge house museum and we needed three or four fans to be able to get that house up to pressure. Uh, so this is a really great tool and I was trying to see if I could find anyone in Colombia that still does these and I can't really find it um, and that's sort of what we were finding with our project in Charleston is that you know this is such a useful tool but so few so few people uh, so few customers really kind of understand the value of it and a lot of people were also saying well why do I have to have someone come out and tell me how bad my house is. It's sort of like when your check engine light comes on in your car, you're like, oh, do I really need you to you know, tell me that there's a problem with the house? Just kind of come in and fix it. But for us, we were saying that you, know, you can't tell how leaky the house is or how much work it needs unless you get an accurate reading on that. And so we really did encourage people to try to get these. And uh, at that time, SCEG would come out and offer one. Uh, I did check and Dominion will come out to your house and will do a walkthrough energy assessment. Uh, right now, they will do it over Zoom as well. And so they can walk through and they can pinpoint places in the house where just from um, a visual inspection are gonna be a little bit more leaky or problematic. So, you know, anywhere you can see light under the door coming through or around the side of the door, any of those places are gonna be leaky and they will come out for free and we'll um, check that for you if you would like to. But the blower doors um, don't seem to be in use very much, even though I think that it really is a very efficient test. So, 
So in our testing that we did, this is a little bit of what we found. So this looks like a pretty big uh, difference between these two graphs, but this is really about $400 that you're seeing in the different cost to run a house. So the column one are houses that are built between, uh, uh, column, sorry, column one is houses that are built between 1946 and 2012. So newer houses are costing about $2,200 a year for energy use. And then the line over here is historic houses, which were built between uh, any time before, well, not 20, not 20,000 and 100, uh, but anytime they were built before 1946. So in Charleston, that really did take us back to, um, I want to say we had a couple houses that were maybe 1790s, definitely some early 1800s houses there. Uh, so, you know, anything that's about that age is getting around $2,600 a year in energy costs. Uh, so that was about a um, 15% difference. It's a $381 a year difference to be specific. And that was testing 118 houses and 37 of them were historic houses and 18, 81 were contemporary houses. So you're seeing a difference there in um, how houses are performing, but it's also not a huge difference. You know, it's 15%, it can be a pretty costly when you look at $381 a year for operating a historic house, um, that's not, you know, a huge drafty, as much as the reputation for historic houses can be that they are so drafty and so expensive, um, it didn't really quite up to be, add up to be that big of a difference. So are old buildings leaky? Yeah, um, that's what we saw. And, and in some ways that's a good thing. In some ways that could be problematic when we're switching over to our, uh, our new system of electric energy that we use today. Uh, but we looked into how to make improvements in these buildings. So again, through the test that we run with the blower door, we can put the data into a program, a software program that would analyze the size of the building, how leaky it is, um, how it's, what exposure it has, what direction it's facing, how much sunlight it gets, um, how much moisture is coming in, and it analyzes what are the key elements that need to be replaced in that building and what's the return on investment in updating things like insulation, getting a new HVAC system, adding uh, new windows, all those kinds of things. It looks at all of it. Um, so if we ran it through that, the cost savings is sort of what we're seeing here. And we had some historic buildings that we were estimating could get over 50% improvement in their energy usage. Actually, 56% was the highest calculation that we could get. Uh, the cost savings we were seeing for the average contemporary house, we could get that house an annual uh, $452 a year in cost savings. And historic houses, we could get a $477 cost savings each year. So there is a lot of hope for historic buildings. And a lot of the recommendations were simply the same things that we would recommend for a contemporary house, which was air sealing and insulation. Those are almost always the number one, number one and two things that are recommended for these buildings. So it, it is a difference. There is a difference there, but the sort of idea that it is so difficult to maintain a historic building and that they shouldn't be around. Um, you know, there are some people that say that historic buildings are bad for the environment and that it's bad to uh, try to heat and cool a house like this. And so it's one thing we were showing is that it's not that different. It's not that bad. And there are other ways that you can look at reducing your heating and cooling costs like we saw earlier with using those um, historic methods that are going to be a little bit more effective than what they might be on a contemporary building. And there is also this saying that uh, gr the greenest building is one that's already been built. And that's really to say that you know, even if you have a historic building that is leaky, so to say, or that is ineffective, in inefficient, uh, it's so much more cost effective and so much worse for the planet to tear that historic building down to put up a new building that might be LEED certified or might be using green materials. Uh, because you're taking down all these historic materials, putting them in a landfill somewhere, and that's not going to be good for the environment. So running a historic building at a small deficiency from what you could get on a modern system is still much better for the planet than it is to tear it down and build something new. And there really has been a strong debate about this in the 
architecture and construction community. And so a lot of the research that was going on in the early 2000s to 2010 uh, were really kind of defeating that and, and showing that historic buildings still can be used and can be effective and can be green. So what can we all do? We can all, we know a little bit more about how buildings work now and there are things that we can all do at home. Uh, so there's a lot of little things and it sounds like they are not really gonna make a big deal and it doesn't really seem like they're gonna add up to much, but believe me, when you put them all together, it does make a big difference. There's also the saying that if, if it's everyone's job, no one's going to do it. So if you live with multiple people in your house, you know, assigning someone who is checking the thermostat every few days, assigning someone who does um, you know, monthly check of insulation or checks for any kind of plumbing penetration, that kind of thing. Um, if you assign someone in your house to make those changes, then it's going to be much more effective than having everyone in the house saying like, oh, well, we'll get to it or we'll make sure we do it. And this is especially important in uh, more public buildings, office spaces and things like that. It's also something good to remember in that situation. Light bulbs. This seems uh, pretty common sense. And even from a couple years ago, uh, it's so much easier and more affordable to be able to get in uh, LED lights and CFL lights. And so, you know, I know that there is a difference in the type of light that they produce. And that was probably one of the biggest questions we would get when we would do these sessions is, you know, what kind of lights are, I just don't like that new style of light, but they've made big improvements. You can even get uh, Edison style light bulbs where you can see the wire filaments. Uh, you can get those that are LED style now. You can get floodlights, you can get um, incandescent light, or you can get um, you know, chandelier lights. You can get pretty much anything. And you know, when we were talking about this a few years ago, we would say at least find the lights that are hard to change and go ahead and put those as LED light bulbs. So those tall floodlights outside the house or any kind of, if you have a tall ceiling and it's hard to reach a ceiling fixture, go ahead and invest in an LED light because then for one, it's making it easier for you. You don't have to climb up there all the time and replace this light bulb. It's going to last a lot longer and it's going to use less energy. Um, they have some great tools at most hardware stores now to show you the scale of the type of lights, um, but their soft whites are going to be good and going to be comparable to what the incandescent lights were before. And they do just make a big difference over their lifespan of how much energy they're going to use and how much money they're going to save you. So we did some calculations that, you know, if, if some houses that had a lot of light fixtures, if they changed out everything from just an incandescent to a CFL or an LED bulb, they could save over $50 a year in their energy costs just for changing out light bulbs. So those types of things do make a difference. Air sealing. Uh, so, we have these lovely bugs here in the picture on the right. Uh, they're pretty creepy crawly, but we all know here in South Carolina that those little guys find their ways into our house all the time. And hopefully they don't. Uh, and if we improve our air sealing, then we also are getting the added benefit of, again, keeping a cleaner and safer house. So it is going to cut down on bugs and pests that can get in. It's going to pest uh, cut down on dirt and pollen that can get into your house. So a lot of people who have bad allergies have found that this is a really important thing to do in your house is to improve the air sealing. So you can get, like you see here, these ones that will just attach to the bottom of your door. Um, I just bought one for my kitchen door at my house about two weeks ago, and you just um, cut it down to be the right size for your door and nail it in place. And it does a really great job of keeping that cold draft out and keeping the bugs out. And it was a pretty affordable um, piece to buy. It was under $20 and you can get that installed and it would most likely pay for itself or have a return on investment within a year. Air sealing around door frames. Again, this is one of those things that just seems like it's so little that it's not gonna make a difference. But if you really do put in air sealing anywhere that you can see light coming in around the sides of your door, um, that is showing that daylight's coming in, that air is coming into the house, and it is important to try to seal that up and get it as tight as you can. Um, this looks like it's showing a closet here, so it could be um, in a storage space, you know, that is not as well insulated, it could be a garage door, it could be um, a door into a full size walk in attic. Uh, so anything like that, that is going to go into a part of the house that is not as uh, climate controlled as the rest of the house that doesn't have ventilation can be can benefit from having air sealing. 
programmable thermostat. These are much more easy to find these days, again, than they were a few years ago. Um, almost any new HVAC system will come with a programmable thermostat now. The trick is you actually have to program it. Uh, it seems a little difficult, but they make them um, a lot easier to use these days. Uh, we had a new HVAC system put in year and a half ago, two years ago, and have one that came with our system. And the tech just uh, spent, you know, 15 minutes with us showing how to use the different settings. And there's also an app that connects to the phone. So you can change it from home. You can change it if you're on vacation. Uh, I will say the thing that's thrown it off these days is that so many people are home and working from home that there's not as much of a need to set a schedule. But when uh, we were all in, in my house, when we were all working regularly out of the house from about nine to five, uh, we had it set to change the temperature down about two to three degrees, depending on the time of year. And it doesn't seem like that's going to make a huge difference. But again, this is one of those times when the little things add up. So for every degree that you change your thermostat, it affects your bill about uh, four to six percent. So if you change your thermostat down three degrees over you know, the course of a couple hours a day, you're saving nine to 12% uh, every day for a couple hours a day in your energy settings. And it does not, uh, it, it doesn't make a big difference for, it doesn't make a big load for your HVAC system to cool back down at the end of the day or to heat back up when you come home. Uh, that's something it can do pretty quickly and does not drain energy, um, not a substantial amount of energy. So you are saving if you set your thermostat to a different temperature when you are away. Uh, we also got a lot of questions about what temperature you're supposed to set your thermostat to. And this is probably one of the most heated debates that people can have inside their house is what temperature it should be. So the manufacturers for HVAC systems say that they work the most effectively for heating degree days at 68 degrees and for air conditioning at 78 degrees. So some people, I wish I could see your faces right now. Some people usually are, are outraged that that's too hot. Some people say it's too cold. You know, everyone has a different opinion on where they like their heating or air conditioning to be. Uh, but as long as you can find something that can be pretty steady most of the time, and then also can be adjusted a few degrees during the day, it makes a difference. So make sure to do that um, even manually if you had to, but you know, the Nest system and others like that will do a lot of that for you and it's um, very easy to, to do. Especially if you go out of town, um, if you're going to be gone for a few days, it's important to set it down a little bit and uh, to change it and, and conserve some energy while you're out that way too. So again, it's a, a small thing, but it makes a difference. So bigger air sealing, we're moving on from just talking about those little cracks under the doors, but there are a lot of places that it are penetrations in your house or places where that, uh, that envelope, the building envelope is being cut into. So one of the biggest is the attic hatch. Attic hatches can come in a variety of different mm -hmm. formats uh, from just a little scuttle hole okay. to we'll pull down stairs. And if you can seal that or insulate it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, we all know that there is a big difference in temperature between the temperature of your attic and the temperature of your living space. But if you think of that literally just being a hole where this hot air from your attic is seeping down into the lower parts of the house or is affecting um, the cooling system, then it's really going to take a drain on your system. It also happens that a lot of times the attic hatch and the thermostat can often be in the same part of the house. Uh, for mine, it's in the same, same, hall, same hallway. So we really do want to make sure that our attic hatch is insulated because we don't want warm air to be infiltrating the thermostat and causing the thermostat to have a different reading than what's really going on in the rest of the house. I was pleasantly surprised to find that uh, this attic hatch that you see in the picture is on sale on amazon.com for $35, I think it was. And these are really easy to install. It's basically like a big cooler bag and you pull down your stairs, you pop it up right in the entranceway and it has a set of zippers and you just unzip it when you're going up into the attic or coming down. 
Um, we had also given people instructions in the past to make their own attic hatch cover. And that's what I have at my house, which is a couple of sheets of, um, of insulated foam board. And you can use a caulk to glue them together and just make it the size of your hatch and stick it over top. And every time you're coming up and down, you just move it out of the way. Um, that can make a big difference. I do know some people put insulation on the actual um, hatch in the stairs in between the rungs of the stairs, like in this area. But really, we want to make sure that the opening, the edges are what is going to be uh, insulated, because that's where the airflow is going to come from. That's where the actual penetration is. So if you have a scuttle hole, which is just sort of a, a board that you move in and out or over to get in and out of the attic, you can also add a couple sheets of insulated foam boards, the underside of that. Um, again, and you can also add weather stripping to the edges of the board itself to really be on that, um, the, the hole that's there. And then that will make a big difference too and really be helpful in your attic. This is a little bit of a diagram of the make yourself uh, a foam cover box that you put on. So you get a couple pieces of foam board, make sure you measure them accurately so that it's a little bit bigger than the attic hole itself, the attic hatch. Use some uh, basic sort of caulk or Gorilla Glue kind of stuff and glue that together and pop it right up there. And then it covers up the, um, the attic hatch pretty nicely and make sure that it has a good tight seal there. And I will say one little note is that it was interesting because so much of the research on this topic uh, for many, many years has been in heating dominant climates. And so when we were doing this project in Charleston, it was one of the first times there was a project of this size, a research project of the size that was ever done in a cooling dominant climate. Um, that's, you know, that's where we live. We live in a place where the air conditioning is taking the heavier load. Keeping your house cooler is the bigger challenge for most of us in the more expensive part of the year versus in other climates where they're trying to to run the heat and, and get the heat going um, in a lot of other climates. So they, you know, these things don't matter quite as much in a cooling and a heating dominant climate uh, because, you, you know, you're not as worried about hot air coming down from the attic in the winter time. But for us in southern climates, this type of stuff, attic insulation is really important. There's a fire truck rolling by, so I hope you guys aren't hearing the siren in the background. Um, <laughs> windows. So windows are probably one of the most controversial parts of a historic building restoration or historic building um, insulation. And it's because there have been, a, a, there's controversy about vinyl windows or new replacement windows. And most uh, architectural, architectural review boards will not allow vinyl windows in a historic district. Uh, these are, you know, traditional historic windows are a character defining feature of a historic building. They are really important to the craftsmanship and the character of the building. Uh, but it's not only that, it's that they are very easy to maintain and to be energy efficient. So really when the debate started, it was being seen as something where, you know, historic preservation people were being ridiculous and frivolent to, uh, frivolous and, and wanting to just have pretty windows in place and they didn't really care about how effective it was for those living inside the house. But since then, preservationists have kind of come back out and, and said, you know, it's not just that, it just doesn't, vinyl windows just don't make sense in a lot of places and they really are not going to be dependable. Uh, so again, in our, in our program that we were working with, we always looked at cost benefit analysis. And so we never in all 118 buildings that we surveyed, we only found two where it actually would have been a good return on investment to replace the windows. And those were two um, aluminum windows, two houses with aluminum windows. Uh, the aluminum windows are going to conduct heat uh, through the actual metal of the window. So it, with a wood window, you're insulating, the, the wood is an insulating factor but it's not with the uh, metal windows. So that's the only time that we ever replaced or anyone suggested anyone replace windows in a house or even consider it. Uh, because windows are so expensive that it's generally about a 25 year return on investment. And that was outside of the scope of what was pragmatic for us to recommend to customers. With a wood window, it's really easy to just make some basic repairs and it can fix it up and make it just as efficient as a vinyl window. 
again, if we also go back to our diagram of how air moves through a building, air is moving up and down, heat is moving up and down. It's not moving out through your windows all that much. There is some leakage, but that's not the main area of emphasis. It's not as important as your tops and bottoms. So in the image over here on the left, this woman is uh, reglazing a window, which is a pretty, it's a, I wouldn't say it's the easiest process, but I've done it, so it's not too hard. Um, it's, a little, it's a little tedious and time consuming, but it's very easy to do once you get the hang of it. And also it's a pretty way, good way to just fix a small part of a window and not have to replace the whole thing. So if, a, if one pane broke, you would just take the window out, remove the um, shutter, the, remove the caulk that's holding it in place, and then you can pop that win one window pane out, put a new one in, and reglaze it. So you add the glazing material to it, which is what she's uh, taking off right there. So it's something that is pretty effective. And we also have this diagram of the window here because any part of this wood structure of the window frame can also be repaired pretty easily. It's wood. If uh, there's a leak, if there is moisture damage, you can cut that section out, dry it out, and put in um, a resin or another type of epoxy that would seal it, sand it, and paint it and then it looks just like a new window, just like it had been before. Um, so it's pretty effective to fix windows and they can be energy efficient. Um, of course, there are ways to improve these old windows. We can put storm window coverings on the outside or the inside of a building, and these can be made from vinyl and they just pop right in place over the outside. This one may even be a wood one that is popped in over top. And so it's a storm window or a uh, vinyl window that is put over top of the, um, of the wood window to give it some extra insulation. Of course, of course, weather stripping like we saw for the door, uh, same kind of thing right around the edges of the window can really help where there might be a gap between the actual window, between the actual boards here and the uh, window where it sits in the jam. So like right in that area. And this is an image of a vinyl window in a historic building. And so it just goes to show that, you know, there is something to be said for the character of original windows, even when you're trying to replicate a four over one, as this is here, four panes over the one uh, big pane at the bottom, you can see that it's not the same. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel the same. They don't function the same. And it really does damage the character of the building. So we want people to be comfortable and we want people to uh, be able to afford to live in historic buildings, but we also do care about the appearance and the, the heritage, the, the quality of the uh, construction and the character of these historic structures too. Insulation. So this is our final uh, section we'll talk about. And so I love this historic image over here because insulation is something that people have recognized is pretty important for many, many years. And there are a variety of ways to add insulation. It is good to put insulation in walls, even though we have the stack effect and, and we're talking about tops and bottoms. Um, insulation in the walls will certainly help. And so when you're talking about a uh, really though the ceiling insulation, you could do a blown in insulation There are a couple other types of insulation we'll talk about in a minute. But you want to make sure that it's at least six inches thick and that it is covering the joists. So when you walk up into the attic, you don't you should not be able to see those joists going across the floor of the attic. I have to admit that you can see them in my house. <laughs> That's one of the projects I've been in my house for a couple of years and we uh, still haven't gotten around to that one. But it does, we've got the one out of catch covered and then the rest of it, mm, not so much. Um, <laughs> we're working on it uh, because it, it can seem like a pretty overwhelming job. It can seem like it is pretty tough to either hire someone or you're going to have to get up there yourself and do it. And working in the attic is just not that comfortable, but it does have a very good return on investment. Um, we almost always would recommend insulation in pretty much every single house that we looked at and it almost always had less than a 10-year return on investment so it, it could even be a six-year return on investment in some cases 
Uh, so you want to have a, at least R38 or higher. Uh, there are some, there are codes for it, um, but for you want to go above the code, and so R38 is a pretty good in level of insulation to really make sure that you're going a little bit above and beyond. Uh, at a certain point, it's just not necessary to go too high, but 38 to about 48 is what I've seen in most recommendations to really maximize energy efficiency, and that's going to be higher than what code is recommending too. So a couple types of insulation, and this is going to be important for historic houses. Uh, there's rigid foam board, and rigid foam board is a pretty good one, especially if you have a really specific little spot that you need to cover. And it also can be really good for historic buildings because you can cut it uh, exactly to the size that you want for something that might be a, a little bit untraditional size for today's products. And you can fit it in and it can fit pretty tightly. Uh, some of it does shrink a little bit over time, and it can be um, an, an intensive process to manufacture this. So if you're looking at um, overall environmental quality, this might not always be the best material, but it does have a very good um, insulation or R value, and it seals against air infiltration. Uh, fiberglass. So fiberglass bats are what we think about a lot of times, the big rolls that you can get and just kind of push it into a, a cavity between the joists or the framing materials. And you can get um, a lot of new materials. It's not just the Pink Panther foam stuff anymore. Um, you can get stuff that's made out of recycled fabric, recycled blue jeans, and that can work really well. Um, one thing you want to watch out with for insulation, especially in walls and in the subfloor, is water, uh, is water infiltration. So you want something that can dry out pretty care pretty easily, especially in our climate, um, especially when we've gotten a lot of heavy rain like we have this past uh, couple months and really think of something that can be that will air out pretty quickly. Um, but fiberglass insulation is pretty easy for installation. Uh, some people can do it yourself. You can also hire a contractor and most will be very familiar with this. Uh, so it does have to be, but it does have to be lined up. If there's a gap between the joist and the foam, then you're leaving a hole in your uh, building and then it's not going to be as effective. So you do have to line it up pretty well. Now, spray foam. Uh, spray foam is the other one that will cause historic preservationists to have a panic attack. Uh, spray foam is really fun to put in and you know covers a lot of space and can cover those unconventional sort of angles that we tend to have in historic buildings. But once that spray foam is in there, it is almost impossible to get out, especially without damaging the historic material of the building. So well, I'll show you in just a minute a, an example of this. Well, actually, we'll go here. So what we had recommended uh, in our project was to take a felt paper or even a Tyvek uh, house wrap paper and to adhere that to the historic material before you put the insulation on. Uh, so that way that if you need to remove that insulation at some point in the future, uh, then you could easily take it out just by undoing that felt paper or Tyvek paper and pull the whole thing out and the uh, spray foam is not adhering directly to the historic material. Uh, you do see that you're, you can see it um, kind of attaching to the historic material on the edges there because you do want to leave a little bit exposed so that you can maintain or that you can see the wood frame. Uh, you want to make sure that you can see if there's any moisture infiltration, termite damage, or anything like that. So you do want to leave a little bit exposed but enough so that you could pull it out pretty easily if you had to. I'll go back here real quick because there's also cellulose insulation. And so cellulose is going to be the one that does have the most recycled material. Uh, so this is also called blown-in insulation. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. But um, you can put this in pretty easily. Most places like Home Depot and Lowe's will rent out the machine so that you can even do it yourself and you can blow it in there. Um, I do not, we, we did not recommend you doing spray foam by yourself. I think that there are some people that will rent that out, but uh, the spray foam itself is really hot when you spray it out and the material can also melt things. Uh, one of our contractors actually had a little hole melt in his safety glasses uh, from the spray foam. So it's it's not very easy to work with and it's not something that we recommended people do on their own but the fiberglass bats and the blown-in cellulose insulation uh, can be done pretty reasonably on your own. 
Uh, so the cellulose, they make a variety of different recycled materials, like I said, different recycled fabrics. I've even seen um, down in the Gulf Coast region after some of the hurricanes down there in the lower sections of the walls that have to be filled, they'll use, um, they'll take spray foam and grind it up into little particles and then blow the little particles of spray foam into the wall cavity uh, because spray foam is pretty resistant to moisture damage. And so if it got flooded or anything like that, it would be pretty easy to open up the wall, take that out and put in new stuff. Whereas the cellulose insulation, if it's Re recycled fabric or material, um, it's going to hold a lot more moisture. Uh, but that's a, a good one to do um, in an attic space that's hopefully not going to get too much moisture issue. And there's that blown in cellulose insulation. And so he's also doing a good job that you see here in the back where it is covering the joists. And so it is not going to have that joist exposed, which is a pretty good indication that it's enough um, insulation there. One last thing to think about when you are talking about where to insulate your building or how to insulate your building is where your building envelope is going to be. So this is a great diagram because it shows when there's insulation in the floor of the attic. And that would mean that that is essentially the edge of your building envelope if you do it here. And so then you'd insulate the walls and the floors and this would be seal it up right here. Or if your attic space is one that you use a lot, that you're up there often, that uh, just is that you want to be able to be more comfortable in the attic, you can also do the insulation on the ceiling of the attic. And that makes your building envelope at the top. So if you make it that way, then your building envelope is here, is down the walls um, into the floor and then back up in the roof of the attic. And then that way your attic floor is not full of insulation. It's um, better for storage and can make the whole attic more comfortable too. Um, you're not, you don't need to heat it and cool it with an HVAC system. It'll naturally be a little bit hotter than the rest of the house most of the time, um, but it still won't be, um, quite as big of a temperature difference as you would have if the insulation is right here. So that's something that we've seen done in a couple cases and can be really nice depending on how you're using your attic space. Um, attic storage is always a question. And so when you have so much insulation in your attic, you know, it makes it difficult to store things in there, uh, but you can add or build in a shelving system that would be higher than the insulation. Uh, so you sort of build a, build a little stand and then you can make, you can have storage space on top of the insulation. You definitely don't want to store anything on the insulation directly. So that wraps it up. Those are the main areas of improving energy efficiency for historic and non-historic buildings too. Um, it's a pretty good overview of a couple ways that you can do things on your own or hire uh, contractors to do some of this work and it should be pretty effective for anyone. Um, if you have pretty, if you have specific questions about a building or other project, I'm happy to take them or just any other questions in general. Hey, Betsy, this is Sean Grover. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah. Um, I have a question about um, flooring insulation. So I have like a, my house is 40 years old and I don't think there's, and it has hardwood floors, but I don't think there's insulation underneath these hardwood floors. Okay. Um, so what do you, is that, and, and I, don't, I don't think I've ever had a house that's had insulation underneath the hardwood floors. Yeah, so it would be um, in your crawl space. So when you go down to the crawl space, if you can see the joists um, under the house, there should be insulation under there and that's where you would see it. So it's usually not right under the floor. Let me see. Okay, okay. So so there's no insulation between say the first floor and the second floor. You're just, you're just doing it on the, on the outside parts. Yes. Okay. This is... Another, so this is um, another presentation that we had, got, had done for this. So if you have a non-solid subfloor, this is your hardwood floor right here. And then underneath the house, one of the things that we would often recommend was to take the uh, foam board insulation uh -huh. and put that up right underneath of the uh, non-solid subfloor. So you can do that. You can also do um, fiberglass bats under there too. So it should be under the 
floor, but you shouldn't need it between uh, the first and second floor of the house because that should all be part of the building envelope. Okay. All right. Thank you. Another great resource, if you're wondering about some of these things, is the National Park Service. They have uh, preservation briefs. So especially if you have a truly old historic house, these preservation briefs are really great to look through. They have a lot of tips and best practices for historic buildings. And so there is a preservation brief on improving energy efficiency in historic buildings. And when we were doing our work, um, they did consult us about um, adding in recommendations for, again, for Southern climates, because there had been so little data on it before. So they did uh, use some of our research data for this brief. And so it's really great about um, getting an energy audit and improving energy efficiency, understanding how historic buildings were built for warmer climates, and some of the resources you can get there. Hi, Betsy, this is Sherry Garrett. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, you had talked about aluminum windows transferring some heat. The um, storm windows that are installed on my house are older and are metal. Could that be aggravating the situation instead of helping? Um, is, are they on the inside or the outside of the house? Outside. They're probably, and then do you have wood windows on the interior? Yes, correct. It should be okay. Um, you know, okay. They, it shouldn't be too bad to do it in that situation. Uh, this picture actually right here has some storm windows there. Um, I think they are making them out of vinyl more these days, but I think that's also just because of the cost effective, um, it's more cost effective to make them that way, but it shouldn't be too bad. It's okay. still a big improvement to have any kind of storm window. Great, thank you. Yeah. And then one other resource I pulled up here is to, this is the Dominion Energy page for a virtual home energy checkup. Uh, so, you know, they've updated this in June, 2020. So now they're doing it virtually because of COVID. Hopefully they'll be able to go back to doing it in person again, because I can only imagine that it would be much more effective in person when you can really see the house itself. Uh, but this is going, they're gonna check for insulation levels, heating and cooling systems, water heaters, caulk, windows and doors. Um, so it is free through Dominion if you are a customer of theirs. And um, I just went to their homepage and then went to Save Energy, this tab over here. And they have all that information on there too, if anyone would like to have them come out and check their house too. That's it, we do have a question in chat. Oh, sure. Where is that? Um, Yep, I can share, we can share this after the program. Is there another question there? Oh, so for the thermostat, um, 68 degrees is the cooling temperature and 78 is heating and then 78 is for cooling. Um, so that's the recommendation for temperature for um, heating energy system, HVAC systems is where they're going to work the most effectively. And then every degree that you change off of that is about a four to 6% change in um, efficiency. And then for energy efficiency with a modern addition, I would just say to make sure to check that any place that the addition is coming into the historic building, uh, that those areas are sealed because that did change the building envelope to add an addition on. So it um, make sure that anything around where those two part two eras of building or touching is coming in uh, and is well sealed and well connected. Also check along the roof line for water damage or water infiltration that can happen there if they're not properly adjoined. Um, so those are some things to look for there. Um, and the new buildings would have the code, would be up to code for insulation. So they should have a good amount of insulation in there, uh, but also just checking to make sure they're as well insulated too. Okay. 